Hey guys, welcome back to Take a Little Coffee Break. My cat is taking a nap behind me. He's so cute. I just wanted to give a warning before this episode starts. Number one, in this episode, we talk about grief and loss, and it's um, Nikki's real story of losing her husband. So if this is triggering for you, um, or you've recently gone through something, I think this is actually gonna help you a lot, but also I wanted to give you a warning that this is what this is about. Usually we like to keep it fun and light here, but today's actually gonna be kind of a serious one, but at the same time, it's gonna be filled with a lot of encouragement and there and healing and it's like there's so much weird weirdly there's so much joy in it um so i think really only the only way to know is to watch it number two this is a longer episode um i usually like to keep um a podcast or a talk the talk show um at 30 35 minutes or less um and this is a longer episode but i think it's worth it to hear it and you don't guess what you don't have to sit and watch it we are a podcast now you can listen to it on your way to work or while you're cleaning or whatever it's available on spotify google podcast breaker Pocket Cast and Radio Public, and hopefully, hopefully soon on Apple Podcast. As soon as that happens, I will let you know because that's actually where I listen to all of my podcasts. So, if that could be a place that we can get it on, that is still on the TBD, but um, not on my end, on their end. <laughs> um, so, I hope you enjoy it. Listen to it on Spotify if you can. I'm so excited for this. She is an incredible, incredible human. And I hope you guys get something from her story and learn something from her story. Also, super exciting, unrelated to what we're just about to talk about. This is going to be the last episode where you hear that little annoying little beep in the background. Like the little smoke detector. Because guess what? Yo girl changed the batteries. She finally did it. All for you. All for you. So... Hope you enjoy it and we'll see you next time without the little beep. Goodbye. Okay, Thank you so much for doing this. Um, this is awesome. I'm so glad I get to talk to you. Before we start, I just want everybody to know for the past two days, no, for the past two videos, I have not been drinking coffee. And I've actually felt guilty about it because my show is called Take a Little Coffee Break. <laughs> and Erica. I'm drinking coffee today. Yes. It's called Stumptown Cold Brew. It's the best packaged coffee. I don't like packaged coffee usually, but this stuff, oh, it's so good. So I'm Wait, Erica, it. can we time out and like actually stop recording and re-record? Because I want to go make coffee now. Yeah, go. Can I do yeah, that? I can stop recording right now. Okay, perfect. Like, I'm like, I, let's, let's have our, our mug. I'm, gonna, I'm going to leave this in, though, because this is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay. I'll After you that. said that, I'm going to leave it in. I'm sorry now. Okay, perfect. Okay, we are back, and Nikki has her coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks so much for doing this, Nikki. I, um, I, before you introduce yourself, I know Nikki in such a random awesome way but I um met her uh because PK and I for those of you who don't know PK and I are missionaries at a college campus and we work with the Christian ministry so we um have this thing called booth where we have like a question of the day on a whiteboard and people can come answer the question and Nikki had happened to be passing by and um came and answered her question and then we just started a friendship we found out so many great things about her and she's such an incredible and you'll know when she introduces herself but she's so cool and she quickly became a friend and I feel like we clicked instantly um and I um I was new to town she was new to town and it was just like a really sweet time and then her story I I had the honor I think of of just seeing her 
story and you'll see why I chose to interview Nikki today, but it's a story of grief, but also of healing and of joy. And there's so much, there's so much in there. Um, and I think that we were put in each other's lives for that, for that time. I think that the Lord totally did that. So anyway, Nikki, for those who don't know you, go ahead, um, which is most people who are probably watching, introduce yourself and just kind of like what you do, who you are to the world. <laughs> yeah, of course. You're so great. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, this is my first interview, so. Hey. Hey um, maybe not the last. Hey <laughs> But my name is Nikki Signs, and I'm 25 years old. So I'm originally from a small town called Beeville, Texas, and I am an Aggie, class of 2017. A whoop, here you go. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I currently live in Westlaco. I am the senior pastor of Grace Life Church, and um, woo, yeah, Grace Life. I love, I love my church. Um, so. Right after college in 2017, I was married. I got married to my husband Kevin, um, and then October 24th, four days before our second wedding anniversary, um, he was in a tragic car accident and passed away. Um, so we actually planted our church um, less than three months before he passed away. So um, we planted Grace Life. He was in a car accident. I became the senior pastor. Um, here we are, eight months later. And yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> yes. And that is why we, I brought you in here just to tell your story, because I feel like a lot of people know somebody who's lost to somebody or know somebody who's grieving, but not a lot of people understand the pain of it and the process of it, or maybe they think okay, I want to give this person space, so we're not going to talk about it, and I'm going to let them kind of handle it on their own. So I, would, I really wanted to have a conversation of, like, what that looked like for you, and just kind of, like, what the process was for you, and I, I got to see you kind of live through it, and, and so I, I saw so many faces of it, and I really wanted to be in the ugly with you, because I had never done that before I had always been that person that was okay I'm, I don't know what to do so we're gonna we're gonna see but I didn't want to do that with you because I do believe that God had brought us together in that phase of life for a reason but anyway my question to you is just kind of like you touched so you just talked about how Kevin passed away and just kind of like expand on that so like what that what the story was like what kind of came after that and like what your feelings were through all of it. Yeah, for sure. So I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, Kevin and Kevin grew up here in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, we met at youth camp when we were like 13 and 14. Um, he went to Bible college in Ohio. I went to A&M um, and we never lived in the same place, but Kevin um, was just convinced that he was going to marry him, marry me. And I didn't like him. And I was like, uh, no, thank you. But he just pursued me for three years. And I finally gave in because I told my friends, if I date him, I'm going to marry him. And I don't want to marry him. Yeah. And then I started dating him. A year later, we were engaged. And then nine months later, we got married. Um, and so I moved to the Rio Grande Valley. He was a youth pastor. Um, then we were English pa pastors at a Spanish church. Um, and then May 2019, so it's really crazy, our timeline, like, life has just been going, and it's nonstop, okay. um, so May 2019, we kind of came to this crossroads, and that's, like, around the time I met Erica, no, wait, I hadn't, no, no, no. we met in August, oh, okay, okay, we hadn't met yet, okay, August or September, somewhere around there, yeah, yeah so right before he passed away, Yes, right before. So January 2019, I decided to go back to school. So that's why I was at UTRGB. I was taking prereqs to get my master's in accounting. Um, Kevin and I were both working um, at a church. Like that was our only income. And then in May, we come to this crossroads. Um, what do we do? Do we stay here or do we start our own church? Do we move away? Because May, it was the day before my last final. I wasn't going to like, neither of us were going to have a job. 
I was finishing my semester, and so we're like, what do we do? And we, we're in Chick-fil-A. I'm crying because I'm like, ah, oh, what are we going to do? And we went from let's move to Ireland to let's start a church. <laughs> I'm all about moving to Ireland. Let's go. <laughs> like, this is our chance, Kevin. Let's go. And um, we didn't move to Ireland. <laughs> Disclaimer. Um, and then, like, within two months, so May is when the idea of Grace Life came to life. Um, June, we resigned from our positions at that church. Um, again, our only source of income. And we were just like, if it's God's will, it's his bill. We'll figure it out. Um, I was 24 at the time. He was 25. So here's a 24 and 25 year old um, living by faith, going to start a church. We don't even have a place. We don't know the like location. Um, and so that summer, summer 2019, we just um, had a team. So we had a team of about 15 to 20 people. We met in my in-laws living room. We planned, we had plate cells. Like we were just like, none of us have money. We're all students. We're all under the age of 30. Um, but we just believed in what God was doing. So August 4th, we um, rented a space um, in like, a, we rented a suite. And so it was one room had a 48 chairs and we started Grace Life. And so then, like I said, October 24th, um, Kevin had gotten a job at a hospital and he was driving to work. Um, that morning, he went and picked up our laundry from my in-laws. He came back, dropped it off. Um, he kissed me, said, I love you. I called him as he was leaving to tell him something about the church. And he was like, Hey, I'm just like in a hurry. Like, can we talk about this later? And I was like, yeah, no problem. And he said, I love you. I said, I love you. And we hung up and an hour and a half later, I mean, so I'm still in our apartment. This is the only apartment we had. I was sitting on this bed. The bed was facing that way. And I get a call. I get a, There actually was a comment on Facebook, someone saying, call this number. Um, it's about Kevin. I call. Are you, like, you, wait, you found it on Facebook? I did not know that part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So someone me messaged me. I mean, they didn't say anything. They were just like, can someone from the family call me? Um, yeah. Like, it's about Kevin. And oh so God. you just kind of get that like initial. And I was about to take a shower. Like I was, my class was canceled that day. So normally I would have been in class, but my class was canceled. And then I was supposed to meet with my group project, like with my group for a project. Um, but I bailed and I never bailed, but I was like, because, okay. Also that weekend we were moving, our lease ended. So we were having a garage sale. My mom was coming up that day or coming down that day. And we were going to pack up all of our apartment that day. Wow. Um, and so I was working on some stuff for the church. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take a shower. Then I'm going to take Bentley out, our dog. And then I'm going to start packing because that's what I need to do. Um, and I, you just get that kind of that, that feeling when someone, like, it's about Kevin. And you're just like, well, he's at work. Like, so, I mean, I call right away. Um, and I kind of know this guy not very well, but he went to high school with Kevin. And he didn't have a whole lot of tact, but again, you know, no one knows what to do in these situations, but he, yeah. um, I called and he was like, Hey, I don't know how to tell you this. Um, but Kevin was in a fatal car accident. Um, like this, this, and that, if you need a lawyer, my cousin's a police, like, this is how I know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, who are you? And I like hung up, like I knew who he was, but it was just like, who are you to tell me this, you know? Wow. Um, and so I had Kevin on find my friends and I'm like in a panic. And at this point I just have a t-shirt on. So I'm like trying to put clothes on, like, you know, and I'm like looking on find my friends and it's not loading. So I call my mother-in-law because Kevin's boss was, um, or, uh, Kevin's, yeah, Kevin's boss was my mother-in-law's friend. So I call her, I'm like, Hey, call his boss, make sure he's at work. And she, uh, like, I just got a call that he was in a car accident and she's like, okay, bye. So we hang up and I'm looking at my friends trying to get dressed and I'm just like praying. And I'm like, this is not how our story ends. This is not how our story ends. Cause I mean, you're like literally in shock. I'm like shaking. I'm like, what do I do? Um, I look at his location and he's not at work. Oh my God. I know that there's some truth to this, this news. Like, cause I'm like, you know, maybe it's the wrong person. What if, you know, yeah. why, but why is someone calling me to tell me this? 
So I was like, okay, Kevin was in a car accident. I know that to be true, but what if like he, there is, he is alive, you know, we don't know that it's a fatality. What if it was somebody else? So, um, I grab my keys and I'm like, I running, I run to my car, but then I'm like, I am in no place to drive. Like yeah. I'm going to die. Like, no, no, no. So, and then I'm like, I called my mother-in-law and she's like crying and she's like, I'm going to go get you don't drive. And I'm like, okay. But then I was like, she can't drive. So, um, I'm like running around like, and I'm just like breaking down and call my mom and call my sister. I'm like, someone just told me this. I don't know what to do. He's not at work. I'm calling my father-in-law, like, go to Kevin's location. So it's just, and then, I mean, it's, news travels fast. Um, but I was standing by the road, and a guy that I had class with happened to drive in. He was in the class that was canceled. Wow. And I didn't even know he lived in Westlaco. I had met him, like, a week or two before in passing. And he was like, are you okay? And I was like, no, can you drive me? And he's like, yes. And so I just, like, drive in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, and then my mother-in-law was like, we're coming to get you. I'm like, no, I'm in this guy's truck. And she's like, do you trust him? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Yes. I'm like, I just need to get to Kevin. And also, so like my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law picked up my mother-in-law. So we're like all like my other brother-in-law knows Kevin has two older brothers. And so we're all just kind of like in the race to get to we're honestly, I don't even know where we were going. Um, but we knew that there are three trauma hospitals in the valley. So I called every single emergency room. Oh my God. And Kevin was not at any. And so then I kind of knew, like, I don't, I don't think he made it. But also I was like, again, like I said, I was kept saying like, this is not how our story ends. And I meant that of like, I don't want this to be true. But I also meant like, if Kevin is gone, like, this isn't how his story ends, right? Like we have hope in eternity. Uh -huh. And, yeah. but then I also meant like, this is not how our story ends because this isn't how my story ends. And so I was like shaking and like singing what can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can uh -huh. make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And also I'm like, this guy in this truck is probably like, this girl's insane. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I'm just like, and so we get on the highway. So Kevin's, a car accident it was a four car collision and so it stopped the highway for three hours and so when we get on the highway we are like we're not moving and so we know that there's an accident but Kevin's location was in Edinburgh so I was like okay well they're saying that this um accident was in Alamo so it's not the same one like different accident turns out later um while we're on, so we like get off the highway, we like drive in the grass. Like, I'm like, I just need to get to a hospital. Yeah. Um, and then I get the call from an investigator and I'm like, hello. And they're like not answering. And I'm like, hello. And they're not answering. So I hang up. But then I was like, wait, what if that was like important? So I called them back and I'm like, hello, did you call me? And they were like, um, ma'am, like, is this Nikki signs? And I'm like, my, I know my husband was in an accident. Where is he? Like, is he okay? Where do I go? What happened? And I was like crying. And he's like, man, slowest talker I've ever, like, again, I'm sure time kind of stood still, but it felt like five hours. I'm like, spit it out. Like, where is my husband? What happened? Um, and he was like, ma'am, your husband was in a car accident. And I'm like, I know where is he? And he was like, he didn't make it. Oh. And it was 1 41 PM. And I remember looking at the clock and I'm like, this moment changed my whole life. Like wow. everything stops stand still. And I was just like, okay, so where do I go? And he was like, ma'am, um, it's under investigation because it was a car accident. He's already at the morgue. Um, we can't release his body until tomorrow. So you need to go home. And I'm like, what do you mean I need to go home? Like, what do I do? And he was like, just go be with your family and start making arrangements. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, okay. And I was like, what's your name? And what's your number? And what, you know, I mean, but also you're just like, uh, okay. And so, like, I hang up. And um, at this point, you know, everybody is calling. Everybody's 
driving to hospitals and I like look at this guy and I'm like I guess you can take me back home because I have nowhere to go and so when we were looking at Kevin's location he was already in the morgue um so so much time had passed we had no idea um I'm thankful that I found out the way that I did because I can't imagine being in my house and just getting a call and not knowing anything and then having to call everyone. Yeah. So I'm thankful, you know, we were all set in motion. We were already kind of preparing ourselves. Like, you know, um, I text our church, Pastor Kevin was in a car accident. We don't know anything, please pray. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of, how do you tell people? Like I text all of my best friends in a group message and I was like, Kevin passed away. Um, I'll call y'all when I can. Um, and again, oh, people don't know how to respond. So like one of my best friends was like, you're joking, right? And then my other best friend was like, you're Kevin? And it's just like, ah. yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's just, sud it was sudden. Yeah. It was so sudden. Um, yeah. And so when this, this happened, right? And I remember um, you announcing it. I was like, I remember where I was. Like, I remember I was in bed. It was like one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. And I saw it and I'm like, what is happening? And not long after that, you were at church preaching. Like, was it that Sunday? That Sunday? Yeah. Well, okay. So that Sunday we met. So Kevin passed away on a Thursday. Um, that Friday we planned his funeral. That Saturday, our church ended up at church and we worshiped. Like, that wasn't posted anywhere. So people don't know that. But on Saturday, wow. Erica, that changed the trajectory of everything like we went in there and I text everyone I was like get here if you can but we're gonna worship and so again like God showed up and then we had church that Sunday and it was packed um we just worshiped again we didn't preach I think I said a few words who knows what I said um but then that Monday was our second wedding anniversary is the family viewing um Tuesday was the public viewing Wednesday was his funeral, um, and that Thursday, our lease ended, so I had to pack up our apartment, move out, um, and since it was our anniversary, two days before Kevin passed away, he had booked a hotel room for us in the, at the island, because we were going to leave Wednesday night, come back Saturday, and so that's what I did. I packed, well, everything was packed up, but I got a bag, went to the island with my mom, and I stayed there until Saturday, and that Sunday, I preached for the second time in my life, but I preached a sermon called Live Again. Um, yeah. And yeah. And that was so crazy to me when I saw that because it was this Kevin was the pastor. You were pastoring with him, but you were the pastor's wife. Like yeah. you were not in any way in the trenches of the, um, well, you were, but like in, you weren't um, the one planning everything, like, <laughs> like, like in the degree that Kevin was um, yeah. preaching every Sunday, taking that responsibility. And then all of a sudden you went from, you know, supporting him where you went from being in it with him to just being you and to just you pastoring this church how was that transition because it was so sudden how did you deal with that was it more like okay I need to get up and do it or what was going through your mind when you decided okay I'm gonna I'm going to pastor this church yeah yeah so uh that's funny that when I, you sent me the questions and I saw the word transition I was like was there a transition <laughs> like I know. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> it was like yeah thrown in there so um, yeah, right to what you were saying, like I had preached once before and I preached because Kevin had to work and no one would like, they must have on a schedule. Um, so I preached like the month before, but that was the first time I'd ever preached. Um, and so. And how old was your church at this point? Uh, three months old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So three months old, we're all new. We, and again, this was a big life change for a lot of people who came with us. Like they left churches they were at for 30 years. Um, Kevin and I didn't, don't speak Spanish and we have a family who only speaks Spanish, but they followed us because they believed in what we were doing. Um, and so even for me, I'm like, no one's going to show up. Like, yeah, I don't, they came to follow Kevin. I was following Kevin. So, uh, um, but like I said, that Saturday, that changed everything. 
um, something changed mentally, emotionally, but spiritually. So I really, and I even talked about this in that sermon, Live Again, um, but Kevin preached a lot about Elijah and Elisha, mm -hmm. and it really felt like the mantle was just put on me. Wow. Like something shifted. Um, someone told me, though, who had been recently widowed, who they were mission missionaries in Spain, and she, she called me and told me, um, don't make any decisions right now. I know people want them. You want them. You have to make a lot of decisions, but you don't have to promise anything. So at Kevin's funeral, I said, grace life will continue preaching the gospel. I will always be a part of grace life in some capacity, but I don't know what capacity. Um, Cause again, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I, our lease ended. I had to move in with my in-laws. My family is in Beeville. So they were like ready to move me to Beeville. Mm. Um, I was a student and I was like, you know what? I want to finish my semester because I believe in finishing what you start. Um, and Kevin and I actually had a conversation the day before he passed away. And I, at that month, looking back, it's as if I was mourning. I wouldn't, didn't know that. We had no idea what was going to happen. But in October, I kept telling Kevin, and I was like so emotional, crying. And I was like, Kevin, I feel like I'm losing everything. And I didn't really know why, but I just kept feeling like that. Yeah. And I thought it was because, you know, we're going to move in with my in-laws. But I was like, but I, that's a little dramatic. Um, and that day before I told Kevin, why did we start Grace Life? What are we doing? Why don't we just move? Like, I feel like I'm losing everything. I can't be here. Why are we doing this? And he was like, Nikki, you don't abandon your church. Like God trusted us with these people to shepherd yeah. them. You don't leave them. And so that really was kind of the voice in the back of my mind was like, Nikki, you don't abandon your church. And so, um, wow. Yeah, that was kind of what happened. And so I started preaching. We never had a meeting. We never had an announcement. One day I just said I was the pastor. Like I had never even committed. I had never, we, no one had this conversation. Like I just kept preaching. We kept going, we kept meeting. And then one day I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm the pastor and I'm going to be the pastor. I'm committing um, to the year 2020. And I was like, I reserve the right to change my mind, you know, like if I have to move or whatever, but I want to see grace life go through a calendar year. And so I'm committing to 2020 and we just kept going and God has been faithful. The sermon sermon. I mean, I literally lost Kevin. Then it was like finals and learning to preach and prepare a sermon twice a week during finals moving, losing my husband. Honestly, looking back, I have no idea how I did that, how I function. I think it was one, the grace of God. And second, I was 100% in denial uh, for a good two and a half months. Uh, but it was the grace of God. That's yeah. literally the only way I'm here. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I want to track back a little bit to his funeral, which is the most beautiful funeral I've ever been to. And I'm not just saying that. It was so beautiful. And you could see the um, the impact that he had on people. I never got to meet him. And I was like, who is this man who like changed so many lives? The church was a big church and it was packed. Like, packed with people and I remember just sitting there and thinking this is not just some kid who wanted to start a church with his wife this was a man who committed his life to the Lord and I remember just thinking that so I kind of want to know your thoughts kind of what was going through your mind through the funeral and like just like what um what even like God was speaking to you in that moment of who he is and who he was and the life that he lived. Um, Cause I think that it was such a sad, terrible, but special moment to experience. So kind of talk. So like, yeah, what were your feelings through it? And um, yeah. Yeah. So kind of, I think going back, I know when, and I kind of have already said this, right? I just kept saying like, this is not how our story ends. This is not how our story ends. Um, and you kind of just go in shock. Like I didn't eat for a week and a half. 
like wow. you like your body like maybe this is TMI but every single moment for almost two weeks I felt like I was gonna throw up and poop at the exact same time wow. all day every day because you like you just can't stomach it like your emotion affects your body like I lost weight I slept three hours each night like the first two nights um again you're just like a whirlwind you're just it, it, it's crazy how the Lord designs us you know to help us cope honestly yeah um, again like I said I was looking back I was in denial I was like in denial that I was in denial I'm like no I'm very aware Kevin's gone I know that um <laughs> But I hadn't, like, I hadn't processed it, and yeah. I honestly didn't have time. Like, like I said, I mean, it was like, he's gone, let's go, services, this, that, preaching, church, school, like, I just kept going. Um, but I remember coming home for the first time after the accident. My family had finally got here. I was like, I need to let Bentley out. Like, I mean, I just got up and left. I was like, I need a shower. I hadn't brushed my teeth that day. <laughs> like, I was like, so I came home took a shower and I, I was in the shower and I was like, Lord, he was a gift that you gave me and he was a gift that you could take away. And so I think from the beginning, and again, like I said, that Saturday of worship changed everything. And so one thing that really got me through was every moment was a moment of worship. Every moment was a moment of surrender because that's what you have to do. Like, you have to take every moment for what it's worth. Like I could, I'm a planner, but I could not think five minutes ahead. Like wow. every moment was like, Lord, I surrender. Lord, yeah. I worship you because you're good. And I kept saying that I was like, nothing happens outside of God's jurisdiction. Like he is good and he is faithful and he does good. And that's really like that truth just poured out. And that's what I held on to. And it sounds crazy, but like just, Again, all of the details leading up to October 24th, that week, the testimonies, the way the Lord was being glorified, like it was tragic, but it was glorious and it was divine. And I strongly believe that, you know, the Lord numbers our days. So whether Kevin was in that car at that moment or he was laying in bed with me, he would have gone. And that's just like what we have to like, or for me, what helped me was just like, understanding the sovereignty of God. Um, did God will Kevin's death? No, God never wills death, but also we live in a broken fallen world, but yeah. we also know that if we die in Christ's death, we raise in his resurrection. So death is not our end. It is our beginning. And so holding on to the truth that Kevin is more alive now than he ever was, that he is in a glorified body, that he is in the presence of our savior. Like how can I not rejoice? Like oh, you're he, preaching girl. Yes. <laughs> And, and that's like what I held on to. And again, it just felt so glorious, so divine. The Lord carried me. He gave me that peace. And again, I think denial helped a lot uh, because I really hadn't processed what happened. Um, but man, God was there every single second. And it all started with surrender. It had to do with the posture of my heart. Because I'm like, God, I can question you. God, I can be angry. God, I can act out in my emotion and my grief and my pain. And those moments came. But I was like, or I can trust you. And mm -hmm. so I was like, God, I'm just going to worship. Because when we worship, things change. And yeah. yeah. What do you think out of everything that you went through and experienced with Kevin, the loss of it, everything, what is and I, you might have already brushed into about this. I mean, you might have already brushed over this before. Um, but what do you think is the most important lesson you've learned so far? Yeah, I think, and again, it's like one thing. It might be a lot of things yeah. in this answer. Um, but kind of what you're saying, like I have kind of, I've been saying this over and over, is like every moment has to be a moment of surrender and every moment has to be a moment of worship. And I say that so much because it's like, whoever's listening, I mean, for you, like, this is true for all of us. Like, I am no longer the person I was before all of this happened. Um, and I say that in like a positive sense. Like I, 
feel like I do not act out in my emotion. I have a lot more peace. I mm -hmm. am not very worried about the future because my whole future changed in an instant. Um, but the thing is, like, if we continually surrender to the spirit, if we continually surrender to God's plan, if we have a posture of worship, because right when we're grateful, like, or when we worship, it leads to gratitude. And it's like, God, you're good. Even if my circumstance isn't great, even if my world just fall apart, even though my security, like my best friend, the love of my life, my husband is taken from me. God, you remain the same. Like you remain faithful. Um, and again, like I said, I'm a planner. So I was always like, okay, five-year plan, 10-year plan. Where are we yeah. going? What are we, how do we get there? Um, and it, like, this sounds so cliche, but tomorrow is not promised. And I learned that, like he said, we'll talk about this tonight. Tonight never came. Like he walked out that door and he never came home and he never will. And so it's like, we just cannot waste our life on things that just don't matter because you don't know. That's like, I mean, thankfully, Kevin and I never left without kissing each other. We never hung up the phone without saying, I love you. We never went to bed angry. And those are just important principles to practice because you got to hug the people you love a little longer and tighter and tell them how you feel, reconcile, forgive, because this life is just too short to live any other way. And I think another thing that um, I really learned is that there is absolutely nothing in this world that will satisfy, that will save, that will be, bring peace, will bring wholeness or security or freedom, freedom other than Jesus. And all that I know that I know is I do not want to spend one day of my life not building the kingdom. And I don't know what that looks like. Cause again, right? Like I'm a pastor. Um, I don't believe I'll be here forever. Um, I'm 25. I'm a widow. What does the future hold? What does that look like? I don't know, but I just know that I want to live on mission because God put me here for a reason. And as long as I have breath in my lungs, He's still got a plan for me. There's still a life I got to live. Um, there's a gospel I got to preach, people I got to love. And so that's why we're here to love God, love others. And yeah. really everything else just, you know, fades away. That's awesome. And I think that that couldn't have been said any better. Um, it is, it's like, we can make our own plans for our life. Um, but there's a much bigger purpose <laughs> and it's there's just something so much bigger than us that is happening um what is if if anybody right now is listening to you that is going through loss grief um I know that this is a very big question um so you can answer it however you feel like but what is some advice that you would give to someone who is experiencing loss right now and struggling with how to handle it yeah. And I, I, I'm glad you asked this question and I kind of even want to speak to, um, loss and grief and cause I mean, right. We're in global pandemic. We've all lost something. Yeah. Um, I think we do a terrible job as a culture of grieving. And um, we kind of talked about this earlier and I have this new empathy and sympathy for people like losing a pet some people are like oh you know it's just animal. like no that's a loss or even a breakup you know what's people your friend's first response oh girl you didn't need him like forget him move on but it's like no you put emotion you probably were already thinking about your life together and changing yeah. last name and the kids and and we just need to do a better job of grieving and mourning and i think um through my experience, right? Cause I told myself in the beginning, I do not want um, my pain or my grief to ever stop me from caring about others' pain and grief. You know, like I didn't want my friends to call me and all I did was talk about my pain and my hurt and then not extend a hand or an ear to them, right? Cause I mean, we're always all going through something. Yeah. Um, and so many times, even as a pastor, I would ask my members, like, how are you doing? How? 
but people didn't want to tell me, or if they did tell me, they would quickly be like, oh, well, it's nothing compared to what you're going through, or it's not as bad, or, and it's like, no, stop that right now, like, this is my mountain, but you have a mountain in front of you, like, pain is pain, loss is loss, we want to compare it, um, but regardless, like, your pain is valid. You are allowed to grieve, yeah. to hurt, to mourn, um, and really find those people that you, that can carry your burden with you. So, um, bury, bury ye one another's burden. So fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. Like mm -hmm. that is scriptural. Like we are called to carry each other's burdens. And unfortunately, when something like this happens, there's a lot of repercussions because kind of like what you were saying in the beginning, people draw back, people don't know what to say or what to do. So they just don't talk to you at all anymore. Like, yeah, this is family, this is close friends. Like you have to grieve so much. Um, and, and that's okay. Like find your people to carry this with you. Um, and for the person who was like being there for someone who is grieving or has lost, be empathetic. There's so much sympathy. I got a million and one messages saying, I'm thinking about you. I'm here for you. If you need anything, let me know. When am I ever going to message any of those people and be like, hey, I need, you know, like it's not yeah. practical. And so it's like that sympathy, but the people who reached out again and said, hey, I'm going to send you a gift card. Hey, I like, I like we're meeting we're going to have lunch. I'm going to take you out to lunch. Tell me what time. Tell me when. Like, hey, I'm going to come visit you. Hey, and or just call you. They don't ask. And honestly, that's what people need when they're grieving. Because when you are grieving, when you've lost something, you feel isolated. You feel alone. And then you feel like a burden to people. Like, I... I even felt bad. I'm like, I don't want to call this person again. It's the same story. I, I'm crying the same thing, the same tears. Um, but you need to find those people who will carry that with you. And then also counseling, therapy, do it. Forget the stigmas. It is necessary. It is healing. I found a faith-based counselor. I wish I'd gone the day after I lost Kevin. I went two and a half months about, wow. yeah, um, and again, I, and honestly, I didn't even reach out. A pastor said, Hey, we offer counseling. They're going to call oh. you. They called me. And that was that's incredible. Yes. And that's like, that's what people who are grieving need. They just need people to show up for them. And that was one of the hardest things for me. And even now still is like, I miss being taken care of. Right. Mm -hmm. like, what, like someone bought me lunch today and I just like fall apart. Like, I can afford my own lunch. I can do that. But somebody going out of their way to just love me just because. And that's, like, true of, I mean, no one even has to be grieving or losing anything. Like, that is just people loving with yeah. unconditional love. And that's, like, what you need. Um, but for the person who is grieving, you, you are worth people's time. Like, don't isolate yourself. Don't feel like you are not worth it because you are. Ask for help. Have the hard conversations. Reach out and, like, people will be there for you. And I pray that people are there for you. Um, yeah. People won't be, and that's hard. But there will be someone out there who will love you. That's so good. And I've loved, hated, and loved seeing your journey. I hated seeing you grieve, but I've loved seeing how God used it in your life and um, how he turned it into something beautiful. And so I've seen you in your process of healing. And I think healing, correct me if I'm wrong, it never really stops. I feel like you every day is just something new. Um, but I want to kind of turn it over to a little bit more positive, just so that we can end on a positive note. But um, um, I've seen you grow. I've seen you 
um, heal, which has been so incredible and just the process of it. Um, and I've seen you kind of regain some hope again. What is something that right now you're like, wow, I'm finally able to be excited about this. So what is something that you're most excited about moving forward? Yeah. So I think what you said is right. Like healing is a process and it looks different for everyone. I know for me, like the Lord just gave me what I think I could handle. So I remember I was like, okay, I'm committed to 2020. I literally could not imagine January 1st, 2021. Like yeah. I was like, either I'm going to be dead or the world is going to end. Cause there's just no way that there's life after 2020 because that's all I could focus on. Um, and then during like this healing time, I was like, okay, I do know and believe that the Lord is going to release me. Um, I am going to move from the Valley. I don't know when, but the Lord revealed to me where I'm going to move next. And so, um, you know, Lord willing again, the Lord yeah. <laughs> changes everything, can change everything. But as of right now, I'm planning on moving back to College Station Super excited about that. Again, I don't know when, but um, I'm planning on moving back to College Station. Um, and it, God has just given me hope, you know, for a future because I would say I have a future. God has a plan for me. But those words felt so empty. Like, and I'm a dreamer. So like not being able to dream was so hard because I'm like, God, what do I dream for? Like I'd gotten married. We planted a church. The next steps were buying a house. We're going to have kids. Like I was going to finish my master, all of those things. And so then it was like, God, do I even dream for children? God, do I dream for ever getting remarried? Do I dream for getting another degree? Mm -hmm. You know, like how do I dream if I don't even know where I'm going to be in the next six months? Yeah. And so, um, God has really, again, just given me hope. He's given me a place. You're moving to College Station. Um, I believe that there will be a lot of healing there. Um, and I don't know, again, like right now I'm doing full-time ministry. I don't want to stop doing that. I have no idea what that looks like. Um, but I hope to write a book and yeah. about this journey. Um, and who knows, maybe it'll never even be released or no one ever reads it, but like, and maybe they will, who knows, but I just like, the Lord has finally given me dreams again, and he's like, starting to put those dreams back in my heart, and so I'm just looking forward to the day, and again, dreading it, like, grief is 50-50, there's like joy and sorrow, it's bittersweet all the time, Yeah. Um, but like, I can't imagine the day that I pack up this apartment, and Westlaco's in my rear view mirror, uh, um, excuse me, but I'm also so excited because the possibilities are endless. Like, yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing, but God, I trust you. It's going to be good. And like, I'm just here for the adventure. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Nikki, thank you for sharing your story. I felt that I just wanted people to hear it because it's such a unique story of grief, but also at the same time, it's not because so many people go through it. But I, I, I think it, it was just something that people need to hear, especially like when you said this earlier, just hit it right in the nail, especially right now going through a pandemic, people are losing people. Um, I have friends who are nurses who are just telling me how overwhelmed they are and that people are dying every day and they're dying alone because they don't have their significant others or their family members with them. And that's just like a really hard thing to go through. Um, so thank you for sharing your story and for, I hope that this helps at least one person that's hearing this um, and that is able to help them kind of grieve or even justify some stuff that they feeling that they were guilty about feeling or not sure if it was like healthy or not. Um, grief looks different for everybody. So thank you so much. And um, I have one more question that I ask everybody and it's completely unrelated, but you know, I love coffee and you know that this is what this show is about. Um, <laughs> hey. um, so what is your go-to coffee order when you go to a coffee shop? Um, and, or if, 
I mean, I, I, I usually say if you don't drink coffee, but you are drinking coffee. So what is your go-to coffee order? <laughs> okay, if I'm at a local coffee shop, it's iced caramel latte all day, every day. Yes. If I'm at Starbucks, this is new. And I want, I want people to know this because I like, I spend too much money at Starbucks, but also like, I never loved it. But I'm like, but that's the only coffee that's available. But iced coffee with cream and caramel, it'll change your life. But at home, Starbucks house blend with hazelnut international creamer. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so when you go to Starbucks, do you get the caramel syrup or like the caramel drizzle? Okay, I always tell them to surprise me. I still haven't figured that out. <laughs> because like sometimes they put the drizzle and it's like, fire but sometimes yeah. they do and I'm like eh. but then like sometimes they put the sauce so I don't know I haven't figured it out you figure it out let me know yes <laughs> uh, as as caramel in it it's good <laughs> yes oh well, that's awesome and and then if a local coffee shop latte with caramel that's nice. awesome that's really cool well thank you again Nikki this was so incredible I'm so excited for people to hear your story and to, I don't know, to just relate and maybe even learn how to love other people better who are going through things. Um, so I love you so much. And yeah, thank you. I love you. Thank you for having me.